In this set of modules, we will discuss contraception. As you can see throughout these videos, there are several high yield types of contraception that we will need to cover. However, before we discuss each method of contraception individually, let's first start by forming a framework for how to approach contraception and how to select the correct method in our given patient. For the purposes of examinations, if we simply know the answers to four key questions, then we can easily select the correct answer choice and determine the correct type of contraception for our particular patient. These four questions are, does the patient desire STI protection? Does the patient have any contraindications to hormonal therapy, including estrogen and progesterone? Does the patient have an active sexually transmitted infection or a recent episode of pelvic inflammatory disease? And lastly, and very important for OBGYN, especially on examinations, is does the patient desire future children? If you simply keep these four key questions in mind as you approach various exam questions, then you will have no trouble at all in selecting the correct answer. We will begin our discussion first with barrier contraception, which includes the male and female condom, as well as the cervical diaphragm and cervical cap. When it comes to barrier contraception, we have several agents that we can utilize. These include the condom, including both the male and female condom, although especially for the purposes of examinations, the male condom is far more likely to be the correct answer. Other options for barrier contraception include the cervical diaphragm as well as the cervical cap. And as we have hinted at already, the mechanism of barrier contraception, as evident in the name barrier, is that these methods will form a physical obstruction. There are some key advantages to utilizing barrier contraception, including that this method decreases transmission of sexually transmitted illnesses, and very high yield to keep in mind that this decrease in transmission of STIs is unique to the barrier contraceptives in comparison to other contraceptive agents. Another significant advantage of barrier contraceptives is that these do not utilize hormones in order to work. And as we will see moving forward in these videos, there are some patients who have contradictions to hormonal therapy, and therefore this aspect of having no hormones is extremely important to keep in mind. On the left-hand side of the presentation, you can see that we have a male patient putting on a male condom. And as you can see, if this patient were to ejaculate, the semen would be confined within this condom and would not be able to escape and ultimately go into the female patient. There is a similar concept with the cervical diaphragm and cervical cap in that these act as a physical barrier against the passage of semen, ultimately preventing the semen from reaching the uterine cavity, thus preventing possible pregnancy from occurring. There are still some important cons of the use of barrier contraception. First of all, some patients may form allergic reactions or may have irritative contact dermatitis in response to barrier contraceptives. Additionally, the fact that the patient has to stop and put on a condom or stop and put in a diaphragm or a cervical cap ultimately results in decreased spontaneity or decreased pleasure on the part of the patient. And ultimately, in some cases, this can lead to noncompliance. Another argument against the use of barrier contraceptives in some patients is that for those who desire the utmost in terms of contraceptive benefit and the lowest possible chance of having a pregnancy, barrier contraceptives are actually less effective in comparison to, for example, IUDs, which have the highest rate in terms of preventing unwanted pregnancy. Additionally, one potential side effect, although rare when it comes to barrier contraceptives, is that with the cervical diaphragm, if this is left in for too long, then this can ultimately result in toxic shock syndrome. Toxic shock syndrome is most frequently tested in the context of nasal packing, as well as leaving in tampons. However, this syndrome has also been reported in patients who have left in a cervical diaphragm for too many hours. Now that we've discussed barrier contraceptives in detail, we will now move on to hormonal methods of contraception. These hormonal methods of contraception include those which utilize estrogen and progesterone together, as well as those which utilize only progesterone. We will begin first with our combined hormonal contraceptives. 
When it comes to contraceptives, which combine both estrogen and progesterone together, we have several agents that we can utilize, the most common of which is combined oral contraceptives. Estrogen and progesterone can also be given in the form of a patch as well as a vaginal ring. The major mechanisms of these agents are to thicken cervical mucus, which prevents sperm from passing through into the uterine cavity, as well as thinning the endometrial lining. And in the case of both of these mechanisms, these are both primarily mediated by the progesterone within these agents. There are several benefits to the use of combined estrogen and progesterone hormonal agents, which helps to explain why combined oral contraceptives are so commonly used. Benefits for many patients include that these agents can help to decrease dysmenorrhea or pain with periods, decrease bleeding during periods, therefore decrease anemia, and in some patients who are struggling with hirsutism, combined oral contraceptives can also be quite helpful. We classically see this used in our patients with PCOS, which we discuss in a separate module. It has also been demonstrated that combined hormonal contraceptives help to decrease the risk for the development of ovarian and endometrial cancer. These agents also decrease the risk of developing pelvic inflammatory disease, fibrocystic change of the breast, as well as osteoporosis. However, these benefits of combined hormonal agents are not without their drawbacks. One of the major issues with the use of these agents is the necessity of compliance, as these agents must be taken every single day. If the patient does not take these agents within the same three-hour window each and every day, then they lose their efficacy and the patient can inadvertently become pregnant. These agents should also be avoided in any patient with a history of a thromboembolic event, coronary artery disease, cerebrovascular accident, uncontrolled hypertension, retinopathy, or nephropathy. This is because these hormonal agents have been demonstrated to increase the risk of thromboembolic events, coronary artery disease, and even stroke. This is also why these agents are contraindicated in smokers who are over the age of 35, as well as patients who have a history of migraine with aura. Patients with normal migraines are able to take these agents, However, those who have migraine with aura have been demonstrated to have an increased risk for the development of thromboembolic events. And these contraindications are something that frequently shows up on examinations. These agents should also be avoided in patients who have undiagnosed vaginal bleeding. They should also be used in caution with patients who are using P450 inducers, as OCPs can have decreased efficacy when used in conjunction with these agents. And lastly, particularly with the combined hormonal patch, the patch has been shown to have decreased efficacy in patients who weigh more than 200 pounds, and therefore this method should be used with caution in these particular patients. We have here a schematic of how oral contraceptive pills are normally packaged. As you can see, the way that these pills are laid out, we have seven in each row in order to help the patient to be compliant and to take these each and every day at the same time. This is because failure to do so can ultimately render these agents ineffective and the patient can inadvertently become pregnant. In addition to combined hormonal contraceptives, we also have progesterone-only agents, including the most common of which, which is the progesterone-only mini-pill. The progesterone-only mini-pill once again works via a progesterone-mediated mechanism by thickening cervical mucus and by thinning the endometrial lining. One major advantage of these progesterone-only mini-pills is that they can be used safely in patients who are breastfeeding. This is in contrast to agents which contain estrogen, which is believed to alter the contents of breast milk. And therefore, for patients who are breastfeeding, we should favor progesterone-only agents rather than combined oral contraceptives. Progesterone-only agents are also helpful in that, unlike their combined counterparts, which contain estrogen, they lack the estrogen component which increases the risk of thromboembolic events. And therefore the restrictions in smokers over the age of 35, as well as patients with a history of thrombolic events, don't apply for the case of progesterone-only agents. However, much like their combined estrogen and progesterone counterparts, patients are required to take these progesterone-only agents at the same time every day. Otherwise, these agents will be rendered ineffective. Now that we've discussed hormonal agents in detail, we will now move on to injections and implants. One injection you'll see on examinations, but which is also very common clinically, 
is the depomidoxyprogesterone acetate injection, also known as the depo shot. Because this injection contains medroxyprogesterone, it is once again going to work via a progesterone-mediated mechanism. The depo shot, therefore, will inhibit ovulation, thicken cervical mucus, and thin the endometrial lining. Therefore, the depo shot is extremely similar to our progesterone-only mini pill and has many of the same advantages, especially in that the depo shot can be used safely in patients who are breastfeeding as it does not contain any estrogen which is believed to compromise the breast milk. It should be noted, however, that unlike the progesterone mini pill, which must be taken every day, the depo shot can be given once every three months. And therefore, for many patients, they prefer this from a compliance perspective in that they can simply go in for their shot every three months and then not have to worry about taking a pill every single day. Other benefits of the progesterone within these injections include that these depo shots can decrease dysmenorrhea, decrease vaginal bleeding during periods, decrease anemia, decrease sickle cell pain, as well as decrease the risk of seizures. The depo shot, however, does have some disadvantages, including that it can cause weight gain. This is very undesirable for a lot of patients. The depo shot has also been shown to increase the risk of depression in select patients, as well as to increase the risk for osteoporosis. When it comes to examinations, the one implant that you need to be aware of is the progestin implant, which secretes etonorgestrel. Once again, this implant is going to work via a progesterone-mediated mechanism by inhibiting ovulation, thickening cervical mucus, and thinning the endometrial lining. And if we look back to our basic sciences in terms of the menstrual cycle, this should make sense as far as progesterone's effects on the uterus go. During the luteal phase of the menstrual cycle, progesterone levels reach their peak, as demonstrated here by this blue line. The downstream effect of this rise in progesterone is ultimately going to be shedding of the endometrial lining, as shown here during the menstrual period. This thinning of the endometrial lining, as well as thickening of cervical mucus and inhibition of ovulation, is what allows these progestin-based implants, as well as our progesterone-only mini-pill and other progesterone-mediated forms of contraception to take effect. The benefits of the progestin implant will be similar to our other progesterone-based contraceptive forms. These are once again going to be excellent for mothers who are breastfeeding, as they do not contain estrogen, which can ultimately alter the contents of the breast milk. These implants have an added benefit in that they actually last for three years, which is an advantage over our depo shot, which must be given every three months. Additionally, these progestin implants can further benefit patients by decreasing dysmenorrhea, bleeding, as well as anemia. However, as with all of our forms of contraception, these progestin-based implants do have some disadvantages, namely that they can increase irregular vaginal bleeding, Therefore, these agents are relatively contraindicated in patients who have undiagnosed vaginal bleeding. Furthermore, these agents are relatively contraindicated in patients who have a history of thromboembolic disease, liver disease, or breast cancer. Now that we've discussed injections and implants, let's move on to our intrauterine devices, also known as IUDs. When it comes to IUDs, there are two types that we can ultimately use in a given patient. These include the copper IUD, as shown here on the right-hand side of the presentation, as well as the hormone-secreting IUD, as shown here on the left. Specifically, this hormone-secreting IUD secretes progesterone, and therefore this will have many of the same advantages and disadvantages as our other progesterone-based contraceptive forms. One of the key advantages of both of these types of IUDs is that they can be placed in the endometrial cavity. They can then remain in the endometrial cavity for 5 to 10 years, depending on the type of IUD. This is extremely convenient for patients because in comparison to, for example, oral contraceptives, which must be taken every day, depo shots, which must be administered every three months, or barrier contraceptives that must be used each and every time that the patient has intercourse, these IUDs are far more convenient. Focusing first on the copper IUD, this instrument works by inhibiting sperm migration. It achieves this by causing local inflammation. However, fortunately, this agent does not utilize any hormones, 
and therefore for patients who have contraindications to hormonal therapy, the copper IUD can be extremely ideal. Other advantages of the copper IUD, as we hinted at earlier, include that this agent can last for five years. Once we implant this into the patient's endometrial cavity, we can leave this in for five years. And this is extremely convenient in comparison to some of our other contraceptive options. The copper IUD is also ideal for patients who are in long-term monogamous relationships. This is particularly true because the copper IUD, as with the progesterone IUD, does not provide any sort of barrier against STIs, and therefore in an ideal scenario, patients should really be in a relationship with a partner who they can trust if they are going to use an IUD and to go through everything that comes with having this implanted in their uterus. The copper IUD is also excellent in terms of emergency contraception as it begins working immediately. As we stated on the previous slide, the copper IUD is ideal for patients who are in long-term monogamous relationships. Part of the reason for this is that one of the contraindications for using a copper IUD is having a current STI or an episode of pelvic inflammatory disease in the past two to three months. This is because the IUD can ultimately act as a nidus for the infection and can prevent the patient from improving with antibiotic therapy. Other relative contraindications for the use of the copper IUD include undiagnosed vaginal bleeding, having malignant gestational trophoblastic disease, we discuss this in more detail in a separate module, having cervical, endometrial, or breast cancer, having distortion of the uterine cavity, for example with fibroids. As we could imagine, if we were to have a submucosal or pedunculated fibroid that was poking into the endometrial cavity, it could be more difficult to place the IUD properly. And last but certainly not least, Wilson's disease is a contraindication for the placement of copper IUDs, as these patients are already overloaded with copper in their bloodstream. Moving on to our levonorgestrel IUD, this is once again going to work via a progesterone-mediated mechanism by thickening cervical mucus and thinning the endometrial lining. Benefits of the levonorgestrel IUD once again include the fact that it is long-lasting, lasting for five years in most patients. As we will see in a moment when it comes to our contraindications, the levonorgestrel IUD is best reserved for patients in long-term monogamous relationships with a partner that they can trust. Additional benefits with the levonorgestrel IUD include decrease in menorrhagia as well as a decrease in dysmenorrhea once again via a progesterone-mediated mechanism. The contraindications to the levonorgestrel IUD are rather similar to our copper IUD in that this agent should not be used if the patient has a current STI or has had an episode of pelvic inflammatory disease in the past two to three months. This once again highlights the need for patients who have one of these IUDs placed to be in a stable, long-term, monogamous relationship with a partner that they can trust. Other relative contraindications include undiagnosed vaginal bleeding, having malignant gestational trophoblastic disease, having cervical, endometrial, or breast cancer, as well as distortion of the uterine cavity. As with distortion of the uterine cavity, placement of the IUD and long-term use thereof can be much more difficult. Last but certainly not least, we will now discuss sterilization, which is our final form of contraception. Sterilization is achieved via a bilateral tubal occlusion, the idea here being that if we simply cut off the fallopian tube at this point via ligation, then this will ultimately prevent a fertilized zygote from being able to pass this area in order to implant in the uterus in the endometrial cavity. The mechanism, therefore, is obstruction of the fallopian tubes, and this is really going to be most ideal for patients who do not desire future children. Sterilization, however, with this bilateral tubal ligation is really not going to be ideal for poor surgical candidates, for example, patients with severe coronary artery disease or morbid obesity. One other alternative is the hysteroscopic occlusion. However, this method of sterilization is supposed to actually come off of the market within the next year, so it is unclear whether this will be fair game in terms of examinations. One other alternative, however, is male sterilization, so for patients who are poor surgical candidates, but who have a male partner who is amenable to having himself sterilized, this can be a highly effective option. 
Another major issue with sterilization is that some patients who may want to have sterilization performed at one point may later decide that they want future children. Therefore, with this elective procedure, it is very possible that patients can feel an intense sense of regret if they ultimately go through with this, and this risk of having this regret is ultimately highest in the younger patients, for example, female patients who are in their teens or 20s. Therefore, pros and cons of the procedure, as well as the difficulty in trying to reverse sterilization procedures, must be discussed with all patients, especially those who fall into this younger demographic. And this is a topic that is frequently tested on examinations. As we can see, we have covered a significant amount of ground in these modules in terms of better understanding the pros, the cons, the mechanisms, as well as the agents of the various types of contraceptives. And I certainly encourage you to look over this slide at your leisure. However, I do want to hammer home one point that we emphasized at the start of this lecture, which is that if we simply ask four key questions in terms of the patient's characteristics when choosing a contraceptive, that we will ultimately be able to arrive at the correct answer choice on examinations. Going through these four key questions one last time, now with the knowledge that we've gained from this lecture, if the patient desires STI protection, then the contraceptive of choice is barrier contraception. The most likely choice on an examination is going to be the condom, specifically the male condom. We then ask, does the patient have any contraindications to hormonal therapy? This includes being a smoker over the age of 35 or having a history of thromboembolic disease. These patients should ultimately get non-hormonal contraceptives. Options include barrier contraceptives as well as the IUD especially the copper IUD. We then ask, does the patient have an active STI or a recent episode of PID? For these patients, we need to avoid the use of IUDs. Therefore, reasonable choices for contraceptives include barrier contraceptives, hormonal contraceptives, injections, or implants. Last but not least, we ask, does the patient desire any children in the future? And for these patients, if they are 100% certain that they do not want future children, and particularly if they are not in their teens or 20s and likely to regret their decision of sterilization, then we can ultimately offer these patients a tubal occlusion. This is Boards MD, and this is Contraception.